This is Rudy Cheveria for College Web Mentor, a College Web Media production. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Clifford V. Johnson, professor in the Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of Southern California. Dr. Johnson was the science script advisor for the National Geographic Anthology series, Genius. The series stars Academy Award winning actor Jeffrey Rush and newcomer Johnny Flynn as Nobel Prize winning physicist Albert Einstein. Straight from the genius of executive producers Brian Grazer and Ron Howard. Based on Walter Isaacson's critically acclaimed and best selling book, Einstein His Life and Universe, and adapted by writer Noah Pink. Genius follows the brilliant scientist through ups and downs of his life from failing to get his doctorate to developing the general theory of relativity. Dr. Clifford Johnson teaches both undergraduates and postgraduates at USC. His research focuses on the development of theoretical tools for the description of the basic fabric of nature. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Dr. Johnson, do you have a website, blog, or can students follow you on Instagram or anything like that? They can probably find all the links to my social media stuff by Googling Clifford Johnson blog. It's actually called Asymptosha, but no one is ever able to spell it, so it's probably easier just to do that. If we can, let's jump right in by your education. Can you tell us uh, being a physicist? <laughs> oh, that's a, well, the brief version, because that would take, uh, that's a 10-hour movie right there, just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, so as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from way further east. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm from the UK, so I was born in London and I moved around a lot, but I guess my university education was in the University of London, which was called Imperial College. It's one of the big science schools, science and engineering schools. Then I did my PhD in the University of Southampton, which is uh, also in the UK. Mm -hmm. Then a, a lot of what's called postdoctoral training, where you really hone your craft as a researcher, I actually did over in the, in the US. So I was at the Institute for Advanced Study for some years at Princeton, which, you know, is, is famous for being where Einstein was in, in his later years. Right. But then various other places. And then I ended up back here in the U.S. after going back to the U.K. for a while for various academic positions as a scientist coming out, you know, just in one place. So I moved around a lot, but seemed to have settled back here in the U.S. in California at the U.S.C. Now, is that something that most physicists like yourself do? Um, yeah. So that's that's yeah. so so. Bottom line is, if if college students wanted to pursue a career as far as being a professor or physicist, they could say that yeah, they will be traveling a lot, and it sounds pretty exciting. Yeah. I've lived in lots of places, and of course, travel to very many places. You end up going all around the world. Science, especially these days, is an extremely uh, international effort. You know, science at its core is very collaborative. It's one of the ultimate expressions of, of the democratic effort of you know, lots of people getting together to achieve a goal. Right. And as we get better at communicating with each other, it affords opportunities for much more international collaboration. So you end up just meeting a huge amount of a variety of people and going to a variety of places to discuss your scientific ideas. So it's a really great career for travel. You have an extensive resume as far as projects, but how did you get involved particularly with the National Geographic Genius Series? Um, strangely enough, that came in, in the most mundane of ways, which is that people just from word of mouth, one of the writers knew that I do this sort of thing, that I spend um, a fair amount of my time helping artists and writers and filmmakers and so on and so forth incorporate science in their work. I, I do a lot of movie, TV, uh, science advising and things like that. And, and she knew about that from stuff that I posted on my blog and she's also a friend of my wife and she got in touch with my wife and said, could you put me in touch with your husband because we're working on a thing here and we're going to need help. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's good old fashioned word of mouth. There actually is a lot of the science advising work that I do, not all of it, but a lot of it that I do, especially these days, often the contacts are done through an organization called Science and Entertainment Exchange, which was set up by the National Academy of Sciences some years ago. And so a lot of my stuff comes through that, but I, I've been doing this for a lot longer than that organization has been around, so I, I, you know, I have a lot of other contacts, and also people just find out about it through my blog and things. So this didn't come through those channels, it just came directly through personal contact. Would you say that a lot of what you do is based on relationships and, or I should say your success, based on relationships and, and networking? Yeah, that's a really great question, because, and again, it actually relates a lot to the content of the show, which, which generated this conversation, which is that scientists are collaborators. There's no scientist who exists 
exists in isolation. So networking of all kinds can result in improved scientific effort, right? You, you learn what's going on out there in the world. You learn that someone else is thinking about what you're thinking about, but maybe in a different way, and that can add some new perspective to what you're thinking about. Or, you know, people just through networking learn that you're doing an interesting thing and go, oh yeah, that is interesting. I'm going to work on that too. All the reasons why networking works in the real world yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> apply up to science because it is part of the real world. It is just a human endeavor that we do collectively uh, and we all chip away at it in, in our own ways. And then we tell each other about it. Did you have any opinions on Einstein before you started the project? And if so, have those opinions changed since you've been working on the project? The honest answer is no. You know, I didn't have any great revelations in the course of working on the show. I'm being honest. I think what I did have, well, obviously I had a great time helping out where I could, you know, where they would let me. And uh, they were very generous. Uh, they listened very generously to me telling them as much physics as, as I could without them falling asleep. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They really were extremely excited to hear what I could tell them and asking lots of great questions. The revelation for me, which isn't an opinion about Einstein and Gottschain, the revelation for me was more an opinion about what's possible to get on screen in front of audiences if you have open-minded people producing a show. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised just how much of the material that I gave them stayed in the script or made it into the script. And that's just great. From working on these kinds of shows, well, not these kinds of shows, this is really a new kind of show, but from working on yeah. TV and movies for a long time, you begin to learn that only so far you can go in terms of a complex idea before someone goes, oh no, we can't have that because people are going to get confused. That's unfortunate because actually I think people are much more thirsty for complex ideas in their media than, than the media allows them to have. The real revelation for me was that someone wanted to do a show of this kind where for a change there's going to be a lot more of the science in there than is normal that was a great thing now would that be accredited to working with a great producer and a director like ron howard and brian grazer they have a reputation for going a little bit further in terms of the kinds of people they choose to do portraits of in terms of people who work on complex nuanced stuff so they're really the right people to do this kind of thing they were the right people to get hold of this project and then help perhaps some of the more unsung visionaries uh, involved. For example, Noah Pink, who is the person who actually originated this whole show. Uh -huh. And he, you know, he wrote an early script that he was originally trying to get made as a movie. As far as I can tell, his vision always was that you can tell an Einstein story about his life and have it heavily illustrated by the science as well. And that was his vision. It's great that Ron Howard and Brian Grazer and others saw that vision and tried to help him make that come true. And then, you know, they brought it into their production company and, of course, transformed it uh, into what you see now, which is this 10-hour anthology series. Which is brilliant, uh, by the way. Which is, which is a brilliant, oh, yeah, you know, I've, I've only seen the first episode and I'm super excited to see what it turns into yeah. uh, on screen. Yes. I know, of course, the scripts very well. But my point is, is that a 10-hour anthology series is extremely well suited to telling this sort of um, nuanced scientific life story. It's just great that these various people with their vision really kept that that on track right now, through to the end. What do you hope that genius does for the science community, with, in, uh, in, and in particular for college students that are up and coming? The first and foremost, I think that genius has a chance to do something very important for everybody, not just the scientific community and college students, but society at large in the following sense. There's a very narrow and I think highly misleading and sometimes damaging idea of what genius actually is. What I hope this show does in this season and hopefully in future seasons is is actually give a much more nuanced uh, picture of what genius is, which is not that it's just sort of somebody who springs fully formed with magical abilities that we all sit back and admire, but instead is someone who is able to take whatever talents they have and hone them through lots of hard work, lots of failure and getting up and trying again and all of those things that 
normally you don't get in the story of a genius. That is so important to show. It's so important to show just how much hard work and practice and interacting with the people around you uh, goes into creating what we consider to be a genius. And that's really not been shown very much before. So I think that this show has a chance of really changing people's minds about what genius is in a way that's positive because it will help people realize that if it were just magical ability, then there's no point even trying to, to do that too. Whereas if it's something that you can see comes from a place that's accessible that then you build on through all of these things, practice and all of these things, it gives people a chance. And so it becomes more inspiring to show that this is a real human being than to just go through the tropes of, uh, of, of them being some sort of legendary magical person. Well said, sir. Um, Thank you. Now, if I, if I can, I feel that your last answer has prefaced this question. In your opinion, Dr. Johnson, what is genius? That, you know, that's hard to define. I, I, I tend to stay away from the term myself precisely because I think it, it comes laden with so many preconceived expectations that it ends up obscuring what's really going on. How about if, we, if, I, if I ask the question, what is not genius? Oh, no, no, that's, that's even harder. <laughs> that's even harder. Let me, let me throw out a few things that I think go into... I tell you what, rather than trying to talk generally, let, let's talk about Einstein. Okay, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to do the what is and what is not uh, at the same time. Great. Just by pointing to a few things about Einstein in particular. Okay. So, was, should we be talking about Einstein's genius because of the, the picture that people have in their minds of this untrained guy in the Swiss patent office revolutionizing the world by just sitting and thinking about stuff. Most of that's a myth. This gets us right to the heart of it. He was extremely well-trained. You'll see in the early episodes, you'll see him learning his craft in Zurich. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see him getting things wrong. He learns. Right? He's, he's learning his craft, he's doing the hard work that prepares him to explore the ideas that, that he really cares about. That explodes one myth about genius. There's a lot of hard work and training involved. Right? I was talking with a journalist the other day about Michael Jordan. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, he, he was the first to show up for practice, he was the last to leave. He was practicing, 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 practicing. Same with Einstein. You know, he wasn't this isolated person in the Swiss Baden office. He was constantly in contact with the scientific community by reading what was what other people were doing, talking with his scientific colleagues when he could, and so on and so forth. So he was informed by what was going on around him. He was shaping his opinions and his, his ideas by bouncing them off some of his friends and also some of his lovers. That's another myth about what genius is. It's not done in isolation. There has to be uh, some synthesis of what's going on in the world around you for what you're, you know, in order to make a contribution, and so on and so forth. I'm totally following you. So what really is Einstein's genius if it isn't those things that people often most quote as part of the myth? Well, Einstein's genius, I think, was a lot to do with the kinds of questions that he did ask about the science he was doing. He was very, very good at stripping an issue down to the most basic question you could ask that really exposed what the core issue is. And again, you know, he just didn't learn how to do this magically. He learned over years how to look, you know, in the mess of what was going on at the time in physics and ask the right sorts of questions. You know, and he was persistent. That's the other aspect of genius that, that is important. He's persistent. He's been worrying about particular, certain kinds of issues, the nature of space and time and the nature of light. Ever since he first heard about it, it excited him. It got him enthusiastic. So that got him really into it. The enthusiasm kept him coming back to it all the time. And then he kept asking those questions. As he learned more through his career, he kept coming back to some of those questions that bugged him way back when he was younger. And so that persistence about those basic questions formed the root of what he did to revolutionize how we thought about space and time. You know, it's much more nuanced than just being this brilliant person who could do magical things. It's interesting how I can't help but think about people like Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin. Right. And they all seem to Elon have, Musk. Elon like Musk. That. They all seem to have, I mean, they're intelligent, but at the same time, it's their, their curiosity mm -hmm. that pushes them. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And the persistence. You know, there's a combination of things that each in their own way doesn't necessarily produce anything remarkable, but the combination of them does. 
So, yes, you've got to ask the right question. You've got to ask incisive questions. But actually, it turns out that you can accidentally ask some incisive questions and not even realize that, you know, you've done that, right? What you have to do is you've got to keep coming back to that question. You've got to be persistent. So you've got to be able to ask those sharp questions, but you've also got to be persistent. You've got to keep coming back to that question. You've got to have a vision for what sounds like the right answer. If it gets complicated, you don't get knocked off the path, right? You still come back to that question and keep coming back. Yeah. And so persistence is, is one of the key aspects. And then persistence is intimately tied to hard work. That's the part that people don't talk about much when they're portraying genius because somehow that's not considered to be sexy. But it's crucial. you just got to keep coming back. You've got to keep hammering away on that one thing hmm. um, a lot. And sometimes it takes years. And that just doesn't fit in with the, with the easy narrative of the magically talented person, which frankly doesn't really exist. Dr. Johnson, I, I really appreciate your time. I was glad we were able to communicate today and, and get a hold of each other. Uh, I, I really believe college students are going to get a lot from this. Um, yeah, and you know, if there's any clarification on any of the things I uh, said or forgot to say, just shoot me an email. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. I really appreciate Pleasure. it. You take care. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been a College Web Media production, copyright 2017. Special thanks to Warren Betts Communications.